sometimes a song gets played and it just sort of, you just want to sing along with it. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. It's such a good song. The second scripture reading for this morning comes to us from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, the first 16 verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. He said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily rage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. May God's blessing rest upon the experiences of Scripture on this day. May it guide the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips. Laborers in the vineyard. It's a snazzy title for a sermon, right? It tells you exactly what's going on. we got pictures of grapes and everything going on. Laborers in the vineyard. And every other time I've done this text, this has been where I have made hay. It's what preachers do. We make hay in vineyards. Makes sense, doesn't it? A lot of sermons have been done around this idea of laborers in the vineyards. Lots of good messages that reveal the work of the realm come out of this. Lots of suspect messages also crop up from time to time. But because we engage Scripture more than once, this go around, I'm going to suggest something a little different. This is based on the work by a um, theologian, a professor at Vanderbilt University. Her name is Dr. Amy Jill Levine. She is a faithful Jew who teaches, who teaches mainly Christian testament. And as a faithful Jew, I think she understands a lot more about Christianity than maybe, well, certainly I did. <clears throat> and maybe even still do. So we begin with the name, with the title, Laborers in the Vineyard, because titles reveal an awful lot to us, right? We have names for things, and it reveals what it is. I have a name tag. It says, Rev. David Cage. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> Rev. For 12 years, I was in eastern North Carolina, and, and if I had a name tag, it'd say Rev. But if you talk to people, they might say it's Pastor. I respond to that, Pastor. Some folks call me Preacher. I've been known to do that from time to time, so sure, you can call me Preacher. My brother has all kinds of names for me, not fit for the church. 
When we give titles to things, it reveals something about it, right? I mean, this particular congregation that we are a part of here is Virginia Beach Christian Church, parentheses, Disciples of Christ. You've got to have the whole thing to get the whole experience. And just in saying the name three times, the sermon will be done, because that's all the time I have. <laughs> well, the title does reveal something about it, doesn't it? Virginia Beach Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Virginia, and then it's more specifically Virginia Beach. Well, we know what state we're in. And if we're not from the area, you might think we're waterfront. We're not. But if the science is correct, we will be soon enough. <laughs> Christian church, because there are churches that is gatherings of people that are not specifically Christian. So it's important to sort of have the title reveal what's going on here. And then the Disciples of Christ makes it even more specific. Those coming in sort of without a background, disciples of Christ might not mean a much uh, to us, but as we learn more about our tradition and things along those lines, the parentheses are important. We are people of the parentheses. So laborers in the vineyard is also important. When we take a lesson and we give it a title, our good study Bibles do this. They give us headings, they give us titles to work from. It helps us understand what's coming, chapter titles. We love that kind of stuff. It helps me out tremendously. But it's been suggested that sometimes things like laborers in the vineyard might keep us from doing some heavy lifting. Bless you, by the way. Because we know what it's about. We know what to focus on. We focus on the laborers and we focus on the vineyard. And once we figure those two things out, we have the parable done. We can go on to eat. But what if this particular parable is not really about the laborers or the vineyard? I mean, Jesus tells stories to cast alongside of the realm to give us an inkling of what the realm is like, because to describe it plainly, who can really describe a God experience with the language we have? Right? I've got a whole bunch of words that I can use. I still can't come too close to a God experience. I keep getting more words every day, most of which are appropriate for church. So Jesus, when he casts this parable, if we aren't going to focus on the laborers in the vineyard to try to unpack this, if we're not going to, going to go down that road, which can lead to some very wonderful insights and can also lead to issues like supersessionism, where we develop the false belief that God rejected the people Israel when Christians came along. If we operate under the belief that God will break covenant with people, then we as a people of covenant with God have a lot to worry about. So we can't go down the road of supersessionism, saying that Christians have replaced Jews in the heart of God. That just doesn't work. And so it's been suggested that maybe, maybe in the time that Jesus was preaching, the thing that would have caught people's ears first is the oikos despotes, the homeowner, the guy who actually owns the vineyard. <clears throat> because that's the first strange thing that pops up in the parable itself. Jesus says the realm of God is like this. A oikos despotes, a homeowner, the, the house owner, the person who runs the vineyard, who owns the land itself, goes into the marketplace. And everyone around Jesus will be like, yeah, they don't go in the marketplace, not to find laborers. They send the manager to go find laborers. The boss doesn't go out. They send somebody else out. They know how this works. And so here we have this first hint of something being different. The realm of God is something a little bit different. Everything else that comes afterwards, the idea of hiring laborers in the market and whatnot, that's pretty common knowledge. So the first thing that's strange is that it is the actual home owner that goes out. And if we were to focus on the homeowner, we find the homeowner doesn't go out once, but several times. Now, either the homeowner doesn't know what they're doing. I don't know how much work, or how much work I need. How many workers I need to hire, so I'm going to hire some. Oh, I need more. Got to go back again. Well, folks are like, no, you send the manager. That doesn't make sense. You don't go yourself. 
But the homeowner, the oikos despotes, keeps coming out over and over again to hire people all throughout the day. The first group negotiates the usual daily wage, that which is enough for the people. Daily laborers need to have enough for the day to get them into the next day. That's why the Deuteronomy text is so important that we heard. Those folks need to be paid so that they can tend to their family and their obligations so that tomorrow they can get up and try to find work again. And so the usual daily wage would be enough. Daily bread, clothing, maybe some shelter, something for the family. But this householder keeps going back and says, I will pay you what is just, I will pay you what is right. Goes to the marketplace, finds people and says, why are you here? Now this is where the NRSV lets us down. The, the term idol is used, and we think of idol being something very, very specific. The Greek here is for folks who are looking but can't find. So it's not idol, not twiddling thumbs. It's looking but can't find. And they work the whole day because the homeowner, the householder, keeps going in and getting people from the marketplace. Is incredibly surprised that there's still people there in the marketplace. It keeps bringing them out. And this is where things start to get very interesting because it's time to pay. It's time to pay. We finally have a manager show up. Pay the people. The last ones there, those who have put in an hour or two of work, receive the usual daily wage. That which is enough. <coughs> and so do the ones who came a little earlier, and the ones who came a little earlier, and the ones who came at the very beginning all receive that which is enough. Now, this particular parable could be used to reveal all sorts of things. We can talk about sort of this idea of folks coming to faith late in life, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, having a relationship with God, either from the moment that they come into the world to the moment that they leave the world, all those sorts of things. But I think this is a parable about salvation now. At least that's the way I'm doing it, and I've got a microphone, so. Salvation now. What does that look like when Jesus is talking and giving this parable to the people of the land that are around him? What is it to be saved, to have enough? Now, someone came up to me one time before and said, what do I have to do to be saved? Like, there's a checklist, and I don't have a checklist, by the way. If you want to know what it is to be saved, I don't have a checklist. I have made a list of things I need to accomplish at some point. That's not even on that list. What must I do in order to be saved? If we were to ask Jesus, and we were following this particular thread of understanding, Jesus would say, do you have bread enough to eat? Do you have a garment to keep you warm at night? Do you have shelter? Does your family have what they need in this moment right now? <clears throat> so if that is the way that we're going to understand it, this parable that is cast alongside revealing the realm, that we would come to understand that for the householder, the economy thing of things is about people having enough in the moment, having what they need in the moment. Making sure that the realm of God is present in the moment. So the householder tends to the people. Using this economy that is very different from the economies that we have grown up in. I know what it is to work hourly stuff. You don't work in get paid. You work so many hours, and if there's not enough hours, there's not enough pay. The last person hired should only get a tenth of what the first person gets because they only worked a tenth of the time. But when that person goes home at night, in this parable, 
Their needs are 100%, and they are met. The realm of God functions with a different sense of economy. The worth of the person is not built into or not a product of the things that they can produce. We work for God, right? What do we produce? What do we have that we can sell? That's why I think household is a good way to understand things. Because what I have, what has been given to me that I can pass along, I can't sell it. I can't sell you the realm of God. And none of us can afford to buy it. So we have to start thinking about the economy differently. When Jesus talks about this parable cast alongside of things, he is saying it is about the worth of the person because they are in the divine image of God. It is about them having enough, not because of the work that they have done, but because they are of God. And so here, they get enough. And those who grumbled, or, you know, why are you grumbling in my generosity? I haven't wronged you in any way, shape, or form. Are you jealous? Are you upset? No dishonor has been done. But everyone got enough. That's another way of thinking of this, of experiencing this parable. And for us today as church, it is something we get to wrangle with. What is it to be a people of faith, a congregation, a community that has been gifted and is called to work, who receives enough despite the amount of labor, but is expected to work because we are a part of the realm. We are the embodiment of the risen Christ. Maybe something for us to figure out in this Lenten journey, how it is that we can be church today. Not as laborers in a vineyard, but as recipients of grace and bounty from the householder. Thanks be to God, and amen.